What? No, let them try it is your job. <laughs> Morning. So for my own entertainment, I'm kind of curious. My name is Gil Borer. I'm not an animal tracker. I'm not even a biologist. I'm an environmental engineer. I came to this idea while as a student helping a biologist come up with atmospheric data for the tracks of their vulture. There was Jamie Mandel, maybe you saw him in a few papers. He left science long ago running some think tank in Colorado having very good life, I think, somewhere in Vail. But, so there is a future to animal tracking work. You should consider that. But Roland and I kind of came up with the idea of if data can be and convinced NASA to put some <coughs> money behind it. So what I am doing is trying to develop new tools that will help biologists come up with understanding of what the environment does, where they observe their animals. So most of my time, I'm a meteorologist. And now back to my entertainment. How many, so some, very few of you I actually recognize. You need me louder? I can't. I'm attention deficient. It doesn't work. Thank you. How many of you are kind of new to MoveBank, never used Env data before? Raise your hands. OK. Very, you? Wow. How many of you, is this is like your beginning of the tracking study. You don't even have data yet. You just know you're going to be doing something. OK. So the next step that you go, how many of you have tracked an animal, got the data and some Excel sheet, and are a little bit confused as to where to go next? OK. Shut up, you. <laughs> OK. So I made this talk at a very basic level, and I'm very happy about it. Later on, during these two days, you'll get into very geeky, advanced stuff. But let's start with the simple thing. So maybe we can, OK. Yeah, my computer has a bad interaction with this system here for some reason. It's very slow. So animal movement is the interaction between where the animal wants to go, what the animal can do, and what is there. And here you see bristle-thighed curlews. These are kind of these large birds that live at the coast. They live in eternal summer. In the northern summer, they live in the shores of Alaska. Then when it gets too cold, they migrate all the way across the Pacific to some Pacific, South Pacific islands, live in the summer there, and then fly back. Our colleagues in the US Fish and Wildlife were kind of tracking them, trying to prove that they even fly nonstop. There was a big debate whether they have stopovers, do we need to protect some areas in Asia to protect them, how do they find the islands. They discovered that many of them do fly nonstop, even though they are small birds. They fly for about two weeks across the entire Pacific Ocean. This is one of the longest nonstop migrations on Earth, especially for a bird that size. They don't glide, they flap, so it's very intensive. And if you think about how intense it is, they must be doing smart things with regard to wind. A very strong headwind all along the way can literally kill them, and there's been one or two recorded events that this actually happened. And the little red dots are a few of these curlews. This is their spring migration going back from the South, from the South Pacific back to Alaska, which I think is the nesting grounds. And what you can see here is that they do very, very smart things with the wind. They kind of have an ocean-wide perception of the, of the wind systems, and they fly around these large cyclonic systems. They avoid the strong wind. If you look, if you kind of pay attention to what they do, they never encounter headwind. They either cut across, they either go with the wind when they can't, and when, when they can, and when the wind don't do what they want, they cut across. They will never go against. And they need to deviate hundreds of miles in order to get that way of flying never against the wind. And if you're a little bird over the ocean, no marks, no nothing, imagine the feat of navigating that. Say, so, OK, I'm going to go a little bit to the side here because of the wind. But they somehow know they're going to encounter a better wind stream three, four hundred, five hundred miles that way and cut back to where they actually need to go. 
And the question of how they do it is amazing. People are working on navigation, but there are other questions beyond navigations where we really care about the environmental interaction with the trek. So there are questions of how do they physically do it, like energetics. How, what is the cost of flight? What is the cost of flight against the wind? What is the cost of flight across the wind? To study that, we need to know the basic, what was the wind during flight? How, what was the energy expenditure on the bird? There are tracks now that can give you energy expenditure from accelerometers or heartbeat meters, but we need a ways to know the wind, know the temperature, know the humidity, know what conditions the animal encountered. The next good question is how do they find the way, navigation? And that has a very large scale, how do they know where, they, where is where they need to go? But also questions of step selection. Do I go left or do I go right? And then there are questions of resource selection. Why did the chicken cross the road? Why did it cross Dawson Street and North Hillsboro? What was there where it go and what was in the other places where it didn't go? Did it know about it or not? So all of those questions of step selection, navigation, resource selection, kind of meet together at the interaction between the movement track itself and the environment. And that's the role of ENV data, is to help you, the biologist, bring environmental information into your track data. So here's the concept of ENV data. ENV data helps you annotate your data. Annotate is a term I kind of invented, but I can't prove that it's me. It's, <laughs> it's taken from the world of web research. When you go on Google or Facebook or any of those things and you click an ad, and then you open the website that the ad is send you, Google is keeping your, a track of you. They, they keep a track which is exactly which side you visited and which site you click from there and you click from there. And that track is annotated. This is how the computer geeks call it. And in fact, Google gets, if you clicked an ad and then bought something, that site is paying a certain fraction to Google, which is then paying a certain fraction to the spammer that give you that, that ruler at the top that comes with some software that you can't get rid of that got you to click it. So there is a, an annotated track, which is showing where you've been, but also where you came from and what you did in between, getting additional information on your track. This is exactly what we do but with movement tracks. So we call it track annotation. Right, so at the very core of it, an annotated track, a track is a, a vector of coordinates, longitude, latitude, sometimes elevation, and a timestamp. Must have a timestamp. So at least 3D, probably 4D, if you have 3D in space and one time. What we do with track annotation is add additional columns of information. We interpolate whatever the environmental conditions were at the location, at the time. We put that at that space-time coordinate of the track as additional columns. So an annotated track data set looks like a regular track data set with additional columns, each of them with a different environmental condition. The trick in Getting annotation, there's two tricks in getting annotation done, it's two technical tricks. One is getting the data, and the world is full of resources of information of what is everywhere. They're just never posted in a very nice and easy way to, in, to handle. And the next trick is to interpolate it to the location, the space and time location where your animal ping was, where the GPS location was, was reported. Now, interpolation can be sophisticated, can be simple. In ENV data, you get to choose which interpolation method you want. But rarely you will have, unless you take the observation from the tag itself, you will rarely have information taken at that point in space and time. You have all kinds of spatial information, which is greeted at some grid centers, and the bird is somewhere between them, and we need to interpolate in space. And then in time, information is reported at standard time, think meteorological data once an hour, four times a day, once a day, satellite data maybe once a week. The bird is flying somewhere in between. We need to bring the data from the reported time steps to the time of the bird. So how do we interpolate? There are many, many ways to do it. We decided to keep it simple, it's generally a, a a design decision we took in ENV data generally is to keep it simple. 
We assume that someone that wants it super, super sophisticated has the capability to get the environmental data themselves. So, and the more sophisticated you go, the more justification you need to give why you did that, why you didn't do other. So we took the simplest reasonable approach. So we interpolate first in space. So we assume that the bird location, there are several nearby reported values. And you can either take a single value and then we use what's called the nearest neighbor interpolation. We find the nearest point where environmental data was reported and assign that value to the location where your animal was observed. This is critical if your data is categorical, if your data is land use type. So forest is five and grass is four. There's no point interpolating it because 4.7 means nothing. There is no such land use type. So it's either forest or grass. If you're just in between, there'll be some air. You thought it's forest and oh, it was just on the grass. Nothing you can do about it. Air is part of observation. Accept it, love it. There is air everywhere. Now, if there are several points around, if it's gridded on a rectangle, we can pick the four corners where the reported animal movement was inside. So we have a, a pixel and the animal was somewhere within the pixel and there are four corners to that pixel. Doesn't have to be exactly a rectangle with earth curvature and stuff. Could be all kind of weird shapes, but with four corners. And we can interpolate based on the distance of the corner to the location of the animal observation. We can do, we can do the same. This is in time. Let's not go there yet. We can do the same in 3D. If you have elevation, we will do it first on the plane on the reported elevation plane below your observation, then on the reported elevation plane above your observation, then we, now we have two reported value, one in the location above, the other is the, in the same longitude latitude but lower, and then we interpolate those linearly to the elevation where your animal, in this case I can say bird because usually land animals don't reach high elevations above the ground, and we interpolate linearly to that elevation. Now comes time. We do the same in the observation time before. So let's say the animal was observed at 5.35 and we have an observation at noon and at midnight. So we will do all this spatial process for the location of the animal. For that location reported in 5.35, we will process the environmental conditions for that location at noon and again for that location at midnight. Notice it's possible that your animal observation are every second and at noon that animal was completely somewhere else. That has nothing to do with it. We just have no information of what were the environmental condition at 535. So we will bring the conditions at 535 to that location where the animal was observed at 535 from the nearest observation we have in time, which in my example is noon and midnight. So we interpolate in space at noon, interpolate in space at midnight, and then bring it linearly in time to the time step that the animal was observed. The next thing we can do is annotate, and this is not annotation anymore, but we just use the same machinery, so we call it that, annotate the context. So if you annotated the track, you know the condition where and when the animal was observed. Now you need to answer questions, why didn't it go somewhere else? So what, was, what were the conditions where the animal didn't go? And usually in every kind of ecological question, you need to compare the conditions where the animal did go with the conditions where the animal didn't go if you want to infer some kind of choice, resource selection, step selection, there's some, for some applications, typically for flight energetics, you don't need to know what was other places. But for any kind of choice of the animal strategy, ecological decision making, you need to know what were the conditions other places. And for that, you can annotate your context. And there is a new interface, which we just finished testing, that will let you do just that. The problem with annotating a context, we use the same machinery that we use to annotate tracks to annotate context. And essentially what EnvData is doing behind the scenes is taking your area, rastering it to points 
you will have to specify time steps. So you, you want to know what was in that area, but it's not only where, it's always the when. So we'll have to give a list of time steps when you want to know that, and then data will parse your space into a list of points, and the times will be annotated to those points and essentially create these fake, unreasonable tracks that will then go and be annotated. We don't want those tracks on ENV data. This is not observed animal movement. This will junk the database. Don't ever put them there. This is destroying science. So we give you an interface to upload, to specify a domain over which you want to look at the environmental condition, the background, or even if you, mo let's say you have a model, an individual-based model that's coming up with one an ensemble of one million potential tracks, and you want to compare those, the distribution of conditions along the potential tracks with what you actually observe, don't upload those potential tracks to MoveBank. The same interface will allow you to annotate a virtual track without storing it in the database, but giving you back the output annotated in the same exact way as the observed track was. Same metadata, same interpolation method, same data set. So you can run a comparison. And this can be done manually, which is what we'll play with next hour, or there's an API. API is, I now forgot, you remember the acronym for API? The I is the interface. P is for program, automated program interface. So if you write a code in R that needs to annotate 200 animals and have 20,000 virtual tracks related with each, they'll be very painful to do them manually. But we have an API so you can put a piece of code in your R script to actually request that. That will need a special password because that can, that can basically give a deny of use attack if you are smart enough and bombasting our database. So we don't open it to anyone in the world. But if you are working on a large-scale modeling project, come talk to us. We can train you to use that API and give you the password that allows you to use it. Here's a, the current list of data sets. Keeping, we are constantly trying to add more data sets, but at the same time, whoever is posting those data sets are constantly trying to be smarter, so they keep changing the data set, changing the access, so there's a med rush to stay in place and just keep active the access to the ones we have and every now and then we find time and opportunity to add a new data set. We consciously chose to only include global data sets. MoveBank is a global database. Many of the users are not in the US and while there are fantastic US data resources from the USGS or NOAA that cover only North America, or only the continental US, if we put those, it's a lot of effort to put them, it's a lot of effort to maintain access, and then it will frustrate many other users who see the database but can't have it, or worse, the animal was there and then moved out of there, so you, you're kind of stuck with annotating halfway. So if you want to use some fancy data set, go do it yourself. This is not the only annotation tool in the world. This is an easy annotation tool. So, the only exception for the global data set is the NAR, the North American Real Analysis. It is there kind of historically. This is why I got into annotation, so I have warm, fuzzy feelings about that data set, and it's there. Anything else is global. The data set are more or less the entire or a big chunk of the NASA MODIS archive. MODIS is a type of space instrument. There are two MODIS instruments sitting on the Aqua and Terra satellites. They are about 17 years into a three-year mission, so they are crumbling and the data quality is degrading. NASA was defunded from continuing that mission because there's a move by Congress to take NASA, NASA away from Earth observing missions because observing Earth will tell us that climate change is real. Do not laugh, this is real. It's a move that started at the Bush era and it's ever more ferocious every year. The decision to continue MODIS was done, was given to NOAA because NOAA needs to run an operational observation of the weather, so it makes sense that they observe the Earth. It took them about 10 years just to get to the point that the data can be processed the same way MODIS was, so there's some form of data continuity. And we just recently added that this is that guy, the 
the Veer's land and the Veer's ocean. That's the NOAA satellite, the Swami NPP satellite, which has a more sophisticated instrument than MODIS and provides the same data sets and prefer, hopefully in the future, more. But right now, there's, they're offering actually less data sets, and we link to the most common ones of them. Other data sets, so MODIS and Swami NPP are thermometers that are measuring the surface temperature, and then you can interpret that into vegetation. They, they are measuring that they are basically taking pictures of the surface with multiple wavelengths. And you can compare, let's say, the green and the brown to tell you how much vegetation is there. And there are several vegetation indices. There's LAI, EVI, NDVI. Maybe you've heard of some of those. All of them are telling you something about how much plants are there. The change of NDVI will tell you how fast the plants are growing, to some degree, with some error. Remember, this is not a direct measurement of plant. It's just looking at the color of Earth with a lot of assumptions. Other thing they're measuring is the ground temperature. So they can calculate evaporation from that. Given evaporation temperature they can cal and the greenness, they can calculate how much carbon uptake is there. There's such a project called NPP. Where is it? In fact, is the net primary productivity, how much carbon went to, the eco went to the ecosystem, very useful for ecological studies. They give the skin temperature of the ground, which is not so important on land, but on the ocean is, is the sea surface temperature is a, is a key variable. They give ocean productivity. They can observe fire because things get very hot and after fire they get black, so you can measure fire and how long ago was the fire. They measure a whole slew of ice and snow products because they have different color than vegetation or ground. So all of these products are there. The other type of products that we offer is model reanalysis. Model reanalysis are products run by a global weather model. It's typically a weather combined earth system model with the weather, hydrology, ocean currents, everything there. They feed the model with the best observed information that they can. So all the meteorology ground stations on the world that they can access, all the best satellite images of wind speed and surface temperature and clouds, radars of clouds, everything that they have. This is done by, in Europe, is done by the European Agency, Meteorology Agency. In the US, is done by NCAR and funded by NOAA. So they give all the best information they can as a starting point. They start a month ago. They run it for a month in the past. While running it, since they already have the data, they kind of nudge it. As soon as the model wants to predict something that was diverging from reality, they force it back to reality. And remember, you, only, you have a lot of meteorological stations, but it's not everywhere. And they report only four times a day. So we need this fancy model to kind of interpret in space and time between the weather stations, satellite reports, all the data that we have. But they keep it constrained. And then they go into the now, and then they run into the future. And they run it for one month in the future. And then the next day, they wind it back one month in the past, which is one day ahead, and run it again. They keep the future is what you are all using for weather forecast. Every met, local MET station is using data products that are coming from the future forecasts of these models. But every day they record yesterday, which is yesterday's the most accurate day because it has a whole month of observed data to nudge it. They record yesterday. And they build this archive of all the yesterdays. And this archive of yesterdays is the best interpolation way to get your weather data for variables that are not measured by MET stations or for locations and times between the MET stations. These are weather reanalysis. We have three weather reanalysis. The ECMWF is European at about 70 kilometers. We have the NCEP NCAR reanalysis 2, which is at about 250 kilometers. And we have the North American reanalysis, which is about 33 kilometers, but only over North America. So you have Alaska, Canada, US, Mexico, and more or less, that's it. A little bit into Central America. Kind of loses data at the edges, even though it's in the domain, it reports none there. Another type of types of data that we have also a reanalysis of ocean productivity. 
It's there for those of you that do ocean animals. It's a very nice product. And OSCAR, which is a reanalysis of ocean currents. So they take all the buoy data that they have, satellite to ocean wind, run a reanalysis, get the ocean currents. Again, very nice product. Another type that we have is there's humanity data from, no, from NASA's uh, product of city lights. You can interpret how many people live in different places on Earth. Again, with some assumption of light electricity use, which is different between America and China and Africa, for example. But that is done, and that is more or less a stationary product. They do it every decade or so, and we have three decades. Where did that go? Somewhere here, the, the CDAC, human population density. And last, we have station, we have Few stationary products, which are typically topography. Topography doesn't change. The difference in different topography data sets is the resolution. Some places we have topography at very high resolutions. Other places, coarse. The best one is supposed to be at 30 meters, but it's only in 30 meters in some parts of the world. In other parts of the world, they're just replicated to an actual resolution of about a kilometer. I, I always recommend that you plot like the environmental data that you use, like the, 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 do a background annotation, look what's there, get a sense of what you're using. It's kind of the best we had. I had to ask for special permit. NASA sent me the whole Earth on a hard drive, and, and I plugged it in. That's the, that's the mosaic of the 30 meters where it exists and one kilometer everywhere else. They are good LIDAR-based digital elevation map, DEMs, Regionally, USGS gives the whole of US at five meters. You probably go to the, your county offices, you'll get your area in one meter or half a meter. But these are local. We don't use them, but you can use them if your animal stays within a limited domain. We have weather indices. So these are variable in time, but not in space. So for example, El Nino, was it, how strong was the El Nino? The, the Southern Oscillation Index, which is nicknamed El Nino at a certain date. So this is true for everywhere in the world, the Southern Oscillation Index was dead. It is based on measurements in one area of the Pacific Ocean compared to another area of the Pacific Ocean, but that index intensity is, is global for that date. So these are just in time, and you can annotate your time series with those. No need to be fancy with background or other tracks. It's all the same in time. And I think I cover all the types of data. The last one are derived data sets. Derived data sets are data sets that we don't use. Most of the data sets we use are open public data sets. You can access them yourself. The links there in the map, in the table that you saw, if you follow those links, you can do it. Each of them come in their own annoying encryption, in their own annoying mosaicing, in their own annoying time step. Getting them for an animal that travels half the world over five years is really hard, and then you need another variable which is in a completely different way. So we are trying hard to make sure to, that we do the correct interpolation, that we translate the longitude, latitude, projection, time step in the right way, and we can stitch the mosaicing. So they, they rarely give the whole world in one download. This will take a long time. So you need to know based on your location which file to grab, and that takes a lot of it's hard to figure out, but for those that we link, we did that. The next thing that we do is interpolate, interpret combinations of those variables to new derived variables. And the two that I developed are the orographic uplift type, so orographic uplift and thermal uplift, so the different uplift types. This is important for gliding birds, raptors, storks, pelicans. And you can interpret the the weather condition from the reanalysis, combine it with the topographic information to kind of get this uplift product. And those uplift products are provided by ENV data as regular variables. Just know that to get them, we need to then get other variables, do some math combining them, and bring you the process derived variable. What I'm working on now, kind of what I'm really excited about, is a new family of derived variables that combine Envir annotated environmental variable with high frequency information on the track, kind of to get at the high frequency conditions of the, the wind. So 
This we published in that paper, in 2016. There's an R package that does that. If you have a high frequency GPS track of a, of a thermaling bird, can be any kind of bird, the thermal doesn't have to be a raptor, high frequency, I would say about one or two seconds at worst, preferably 10 hertz, but one, a, a ping every second will work too. From the way they circle about and the way those circles kind of drift away, we can calculate what was the wind speed and give you a very nice vertical profile of the boundary layer during flight. This is very important if you try to interpret kind of flight condition and step selection energetic of the flight. I'm working now on ways to calculate turbulence from that, but think about ocean animals. If you knew the ocean currents and you can measure the temperature from the tag, you probably can tell a lot of interesting things about turbidity or I don't know, any other stuff that may be interesting for you in the ocean. So kind of try to consider that. Can you take the information on the tag, combine it with annotated inf environmental information and derive a whole new variable that is at the, at the observed location that is relevant for the movement that you're trying to model? Now, how do you handle, how do you, so Movement tracks are already 4D, so you have 3D in space and time. So that's already hard to look at. We typically reduce them to what we can see is 2D. We can animate 3D, so we do 2D in time. So we need a way to reduce all of that complexity, so ways to look at annotated data. The easy way is the annotated track view. We can either use a color or an arrow. If you annotate with a vector, think of wind speed and direction, you can put an arrow on each point. If you do temperature or vegetation, you can put use a color scale. Here you have the tailwind on a color scale. So at each point, we took the 3D locations and reduced them to 2D, so we forget about elevation. We also forget about time. We just take all the points, put them in a, at, a, at a single snapshot. And then each point you can color with some in information. You can do one variable like that. If you add an arrow, you can add a vector type variable as well. Maybe the point size can be another one, but that's already getting too complicated. When you work with annotated variable, you will see, you start looking at them one by one, and after about a month or so, you'll just look at the numbers and can read the matrix, and you'll need that to show it to your supervisor. A fancier way of looking at annotated data is time cube. So in a time cube, remember that both the location is dynamic in time. The, the animal is not in all of those places at the same time. It is moving around. When we show it on a map, we are losing that aspect of movement, which is critical. At the same time, environmental conditions change in time. And in fact, it's critical for us to understand which condition was relevant when. That's often the big question. So with the time cube, we replace the third dimension, the elevation. We can easily project 3D onto a 2D screen, and we can use the third dimension instead of elevation, use time. So we know that this animal, this albatross, started at the Galapagos Island, kind of, it went straight up, which means that it flew around the Galapagos Island, or maybe it was sitting on the nest and didn't even go anywhere. So we are moving up in time. Then it started flying towards Peru, did some stuff there, flew back, stayed in the Galapagos for a while, for about 10 days, then flew again. And we can watch the color, which is the tailwind speed, as it flies. And you will notice that every time it's going towards Peru, it's kind of bluish or even red. Every time it's coming back, it's, it's yellowish, so blue, blue is the negative wind, so negative tailwind means headwind, so it's against you. Yellow red is strong tailwind, it's pushing you. So it's kind of telling us it's hard to get there and easy to come back. And they do kind of a weird circular track, which we think is because of here. So they don't go the same way there and back. You see they go there kind of straight, opposite. They uh, I forgot now which is there. I think they go there straight, where it's blue, where it's hard, so they get short distance, then they come back from the south with the wind 
and do this kind of circa. Now my former postdoc and now famous professor on its own in Minnesota, Somi Dodge, and you can email her, talk to her, she's super nice. She developed a visualization tool for ENV data. So the, the input for, this is a, a software, talk to Somi, she will give it to you. She always need to perfect it, so she never posted it. Is it posted like open, or she just give it to you? Right, but the movement Google Drive folder is some beta version that she didn't release to the world. And for this workshop, she lent it, she gave me a copy, which I uploaded. Right, so in the Google Drive for this workshop, there is a copy of that, which is the most advanced to them. And if you need, in the future, talk to Somi Dodge, maybe she advanced it. This is very, so it's using the color and the width of the ribbon, to, so you can put two variables. One is color, the other one is width. You can drag along, can I make it run again? Really? Come on. That is strange. Okay, and okay. So you can either run along, so this shows you different animals, this shows you the time, and this comes for the de deployment. There's a deployment manager in MoveBank, so this is kind of coming from there, showing you which tag was on what animal when. It's a very useful tool, help you organize your data, but let you kind of drag along the deployment manager to either to choose the snapshot of when you want to animate, when to start your animation, or kind of show you what you're seeing, which animal is visualized at this point. There's another bar where you can choose the, the speed of the, of the animation if you animate or to snapshot it at the moment and choose which variables you want to show and what color you want each variable. It lets you choose, I think, one background variable. This version did not have it, but I think it exists, not 100% sure. And up to two annotated, var two variables as annotation and one variable as background. It has specific requirements for metadata or how they should look like, but it's basically the way they come out of your annotated data project in ENV data. And again, this is a very nice tool to explore your data before you know what you have, show it to others. Yes? And, and this is exportable into a, some format that could be used in a presentation? So this is a Java software. So in, in a presentation, you can either put a, you can put a link and click it and it will animate, or you can basically save a cycle of screenshots. So this is made, if you notice, with a... With a Do a screen recording with the... Screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. turn it into an MPEG. Yeah, because there's no audio anyway. So um, just do like a... a screen, uh, yeah. It did have a video, a web version of it at least once, but you would just always use the video. Yeah, I remember that. I It, Somi is working on that. It's getting more and more sophisticated. That's why I said con, use what we have now in the workshop. If it ever gets real and you need it for your real life about a year or two from now, talk to Somi. There may be a better version with more optionality. One thing which is truly challenging is using very large data sets. So this tool kind of crepes out, gets stuck or crashes. There is a certain size of data set which will kill it. But there's a certain size of data set will kill anything. So be, be patient with your, with your tools. So this was not developed as a large data super visualization. It was developed as a nice and easy way to show movement tracks. So ways around that is to sparse your track by picking every 10th point. Don't use a very high resolution background, which is not needed, and all kinds of other. Don't, yeah, there's many ways to sparse your data, and if you do that before you give it to the tool, it will work fine. So that's the infrastructure. That's what ENV data does. That's what's there. Ah, I'm good on time. Now I'll give you some examples of 
what can you do with end data? So I'm, I, I hope that by now each of you starts running imaginations in your head of what you're going to do for your data. And OK, yeah, I always want to know that. I hope it's possible. And sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes not. But here's a few things that we as the MoveBank team and other scientists that came to us for help and ideas already did and published with that. And it's not everything, just a few that I really like. So this is a study by Kamran Safi. Kami is one of the researchers in the Max Planck Institute, doing a lot of good work. Again, if you ever need to know something about anything, especially statistics and R, with the context of movement data, I would urge you to email Kami and ask him or chat with him in some conference. We, ha we Our collaborators in the USGS may have a large study of waterfowl. Ducks, geese, I don't know, you're, some of you are bird people, you know. You can list the families of waterfowl better than me. But the context there was the, the movement of the flu. This, was, this started a long time ago, by now, almost 10 years, where there was this global bird flu epidemic. And the hypothesis was that the bird flu is moving around the world with wild geese and wild waterfowl, and then they interact with farm with farm animals, like with farm with geese and chickens in coops somewhere, and they want to know where are those places of interface where a, a sick wild bird can transmit to a captive agricultural bird, where it's high density and then it spreads and then it's terrible. You need to kill all the chickens, huge economic impact, especially in Asia. So they had a huge data set of waterfowl, and we processed that data set. So this is one species. This, I think, is bar-headed goose, no? Bird people. Bar-headed goose? Ah, barnacle goose. Thank you. This is the barnacle goose. And if you plot the model-model wind support versus the model-model ground speed. Now, ground speed is what we know from the track. And this, this figure is from a very, very early version of that paper where they were still anchored in reality. Very quickly, they move into some crazy statistics where they started doubting the foundation of how would you calculate ground speed. So if you have two, an incremented track and you calculate ground speed as the time, the distance between those two points divided by the difference in time, what you have is a time-dependent estimate. It's a scale-dependent estimate of the speed. Because if you will sparse it to every third point, to every tenth point, you will get a different speed because the movement pattern is not straight. This is only true if it's moving straight, and it never does. And they were doing all kinds of crazy stuff to try to get the statistics of that scale independent. So if you go to the paper itself, this figure is not there anymore. All kind of fancy stats. But I like it still when it was easy to comprehend. There's a very tight correlation between the observed speed and wind speed, wind support. Wind support is basically the tailwind. You have, it's a derived variable, but it's very easy to derive it using the, the wind along the longitude. The longitudinal wind with the latitudinal wind gets the wind speed and direction and then uses the bird orientation, which is another scale dependent. You can either use the instantaneous orientation from the GPS, or you can look at the, at the incremental location and find a direction. They, again, they will come out differently, which again spawned that complicated paper. But let's assume they choose one method. It doesn't matter for that purpose. So we have, we can look at the wind at the vector component of the wind at the direction of the movement of the bird, which will be tailwind, a derived variable, because it combines data on the track and annotated data of two different variables, longitudinal, latitudinal wind. So that's wind support, and we compare that as the wind speed. And obviously, if there's a strong wind support, you would expect higher movement, higher movement speed. But that's very basic. If you ask bird people, they say, no, the most ideal is to go across the wind. There's all kind of theories of what they do and how they do. Barnacle geese do none of it. Strong wind, 
you go fast. <laughs> Weak wind, you go slow. Negative wind, you go very slow. So if the wind is against you, you go very linear, very tight, very high R squared. So R squared here is about the 0 0.9, 0 0.8 something. Anything in the nature with more than 0.3, you know it's real. Like, you've, you've seen nature. Nature is dirty. So this is from the same study taking, so you see the barnacle geese should be one of those points, or maybe not. Yeah, it's the first. It's the red point. And there's many other species there. And what we're plotting here is the R square, is the how tight is the relationship between wind support and movement speed. So if movement speed is nothing but a simple linear function of wind support, we have a very powerful tool of predicting when this infected wave of geese are going to come anywhere on Earth, right? We have the wind fields. We know where they're going. Put a line, and you're there. They'll make our life very, very simple. And as long and what we put on the x-axis is another variable that we give. It's a, one of those stationary in time. It's one of the geological variables. is distance to land. For any point of Earth, we say how close it is to land. So if it's negative, it's far from the shoreline. If it's positive, it's in the ocean. So you can kind of know if you are over the sea or over the land or how far are you from the shoreline. It's a very nice variable. So that distance to land versus the R square. And obviously, each point in the migration track has a different R squares, has a different distance to land, so we bin them. We took per species all the points which are on land, and then for the same species, then collected all the points which are close to the shoreline, deep in the ocean, very deep in the ocean, and drew that plot. And you see that as long as it's larger than zero, so meaning you are over the ocean, the R squares are very, very high, above 0.5, which means a very direct, very linear relationship between wind speed and movement speed. As long as you hit land, all the theories break. Everything is a complete mess. Why is that? We're not sure. Either the birds are doing, either over the ocean, they're just bored, they just want to get out of it and fly straight, and over land, they have a lot of other interesting things. They need to stop and eat. They need to go some specific places. That can be happening. Wind patterns are much more complex over land because the mountains kind of break the wind, and we have all kinds of heating patterns. Complicated things happen, so the wind is more complicated. Wind estimation error is much higher because the resolution of our data set is 70 kilometers, which when the wind is very smooth over the ocean, that's perfect. We're over a mountainous region, 70 kilometers makes no sense. It could be one can be the valley, the other can be the peak of three mountains away. So your wind estimation error is higher. The movement pattern of the birds change becomes much more tortuous over land. So our ability to predict the movement speed from the wind speed kind of degrades to almost nothing over land. And the point of that is you always need to consider scale and pattern. So when you think of which environmental variable you want to use, I know that as ecologists, your instinct will always be, I want the highest resolution database possible, everything, everywhere. That's going to fail because it's too much information, and if you if you have a meter scale database, your GPS errors, so your knowledge of where your animal is is not within a meter. So even if you have a great meter scale database, just the error from your GPS may fail your conclusion depending what you try to find. So always consider the error of your movement. If Okay, think about if you have a weather pattern every hour, but you have observation of your animal once a day. Which hour are you going to use? You need to think of how to match those temporal scales, spatial scales. What is the air pattern and accuracy of each of the environmental data that you're using versus your track? And at what scale is your question? Are we trying to understand movement from Alaska to the South Pacific and kind of get the larger scale movement? Or do we have a little kinkachu that we want to know if it moved two balsa trees away or just one balsa tree away because of maybe another liana that grows in between? So for different questions, you need to consider different scales of environmental variables. Some of them exist, some of them not. And the other thing about scale, don't rule out course information. Always look at the pattern. So when I started with the study of the, of the turkey vulture movements in NAR data, 
Now is at 32 kilometers. The vultures were moving from Canada to Venezuela. And the claim was, yeah, 30 kilometers is way too coarse. You're not going to get uh, thermals in 30 kilometers. Yes, there are no thermals in 30 kilometers. But we can parameterize thermal tendency in 30 kilometers and every four hours to get some information. Is that information adequate to our study? I don't know. Let's check. So if you compare, if you look at the correlation between that environmental information and your track, if you compare the background and the use data, maybe course, maybe there is, maybe the course data is good enough. Maybe there is enough spatial correlation within the movement patterns, so then even course data, even though you think doesn't make sense in that point where you see your animal, it still holds enough information to answer the questions that you want. So always consider the scale. Here is the the fences, so going from very coarse scale, this is 70 kilometers flying hundreds of kilometers over the ocean to very, very high scale. So we have vultures flying from Bhutan to Tibet. They cross the Himalaya. They do not flap, never. They, they just go over the mountains, fly. And this is a real question in gliding, in aviation, how on earth do they do that? So. If any one of you needs a helicopter rescue on the peak of Everest, it's really hard because helicopters can barely fly. So even though they spin the rotor very fast, there's not enough air to keep the lift high. So imagine for a gliding animal, it's the same problem. How can it glide if the air is thin? If the air is thin, it's actually sinking much faster. So those vultures need to do some aerodynamic adjustment. They need to do some kind of magic to keep soaring up over Mount Everest. So what we did, we combined, we annotated, these are one hertz tracks. We annotated the tracks with the high resolution topography of the Himalaya. So we know how high above ground they are, which is an important variable. We use the pressure, there's a pressure sensor on the tag. So we use annotated information from the tag itself that gives us pressure, which is, another, is an estimate of the elevation above sea level, not above ground, of the vultures. And then we annotated it with the wind speed from ECMWF, combine everything together with our new algorithm that's using the, the soaring patterns to get the wind speed. And we got these beautiful graphs showing the vertical, the average vertical profile along those thermaline columns that the, that the vultures, the griffin vultures make. On the y-axis is air density. Air density is linearly related with elevation. Air density is sea level is about one. Air density at the top of Everest is about 0.6. So it gets to about half. At sea level is about 1.1. So it's really about half. And you see that airspeed, now the very tricky variable in birds. We know ground speed from the GPS. We know wind speed from very coarse estimation of the wind. But to know airspeed, we need to know the exact wind around the birds, compare that with the ground speed, subtract them. Air, wind speed minus ground speed will give you airspeed. This is how fast it's moving relative to the air around it. And we see that what they do is basically they accelerate their circles. And if you fly faster, you get more lift. And the red curve is the theoretical curve of how fast you need to accelerate to keep a constant lift as the air density degrade. And you see that those griffin vultures are geniuses in, aero, in fluid dynamics. They know the curve. They know the curve very, very well. And uh, above the, to do that, to accelerate, they basically tighten. Well, they have a fancy way. They tighten the circle at the beginning, then they, they make the circle larger, but then they need to deep down to actually accelerate. We thought that they were tightening the circle. So the problem with tightening the circle, you go faster, but you need to tilt more, so then you lose lift. So that's a bad solution. Plus, as you go higher, the thermos expands. So you can actually go wider. So they kind of they bank shallower, but then they need to accelerate in other ways, probably stuff they do with their tail. We're not sure. Now a little intro to resource selection functions and stuff that John will teach you later today or tomorrow. 
This is the very, very basic principle of how it works. You look at, let's look at the available, the, the, the top two graphs. So available is basically your annotated track. We know the animal has been in those locations in time. We know what, we interpolate the environmental conditions to those, so we have a single environmental variable, in this case, ocean productivity. We know what was ocean productivity at every location that we definitely did observe the animal, which is where it pinged. Now we can go fancy in how we interpolate between those points, assume that the animal, if it's been here and been here, probably has been in between, but here we ignore that. We just take those locations that we for sure saw the animal. So this is a study of albatrosses. They nest on the Galapagos Island. They fly all the way to Peru to feed their chicks. It takes them about two days. So they leave the chicks for a few days unprotected on the nest. Go on YouTube, do albatross eaten by rats. Albatross chick eaten by rats. The very scary YouTube. But it's really bad to leave your chick unprotected on a nest on the ground. There's a high chick mortality and so on. So the question is, why would they do that? You assume evolution is ever so smart and the best solution will evolve. How can it be better to go all the way to Peru than looking for fish around the Galapagos Island? Now, remember the Galapagos, everybody said, yeah, there's this ocean up welling is such a fertile ocean islands. All the seals are coming to the Galapagos to eat there. Why don't the albatross eat there and don't leave the chick for three, four days unprotected on the nest? That was the question. We tried to figure it out. So we annotated ocean productivity, the observed ocean productivity. This is that available. In, in, the, in the, sorry, this is the use. Everything I said about available, ignore it, remove it from your brain. I'm confused. <laughs> this is the used, used. This is what they do. This is not what was there. This is what we know they use. This is what we observe them doing. So this is the used. So now let's look here. This is, the, this is the used condition around the Galapagos Island where they were flying. They do fly around the island every now and then. Every point that they fly around, we annotate it with ocean productivity. We got that curve. It peaks at around 800, which is very high productivity. And it has a tail going to about 1,700, which is very high productivity. But that's what it looks like. Great. Do we learn something from it? No. We just, well, we learned something, but it doesn't answer our question. It doesn't tell us why it flies to Peru. Now let's look at Peru. So this is the same thing. Every time in an area around, so we, we box an area around the coast of Peru, and every observed point, we interpolated ocean productivity in space and time to that point. This is that used in Peru. Here. And you see, you see two striking differences. One is that the peak now is around 2,000, which is way higher than 800. It's insanely high. And then there's a tail running all the way to 5,000. To 5, now, does that mean that this is why they go to Peru? Maybe. Do they really care about it? Maybe they just change condition. Might, let me give you another example. You're looking at the temperature preference of si we all came to North Carolina. Some of us came from Canada. I can make a study of the temperature preference of Canadian animal movement researchers and show that the temperature in North Carolina, while they were in North Carolina, was much higher than the temperature in Canada. Does that mean that they came for the temperature? No. It just means that the temperature happened to be higher in that place. So I need to show that they targeted that specifically. How do I show that? Let's compare the use to the available. So if they closed their eyes, didn't care about anything, and then just stumbled randomly around the same area, what kind of conditions would they encounter? So let's look at the around Galapagos available. This is top right, up there. For this, we need the background annotation. So we, anno we, we choose a box, and again, Resource selection functions get more and more complicated in how you choose those points that you consider available, because what's really available is a very sophisticated question. But here we kept it simple. We just use a box within the flight distance, the average daily flight distance of the albatross. We put the box around the islands and look at the average 
ocean productivity there. And you can see that is more or less identical to the one that, it, that they use, which means that they completely didn't care about ocean productivity while they were flying around the, the Galapagos. If they flew at random with respect to ocean productivity, they would encounter the same thing that we observe, which means they don't care about it. Whatever was around there, they, they took it. Let's look, do the same thing over the Peruvian coast. This is what they use, remember that this is the available. Notice that the available peaks at about the same place, at 800. So if they would stumble around randomly around, along the Peruvian coast, the, the peak of ocean productivity would be around 800, the most common area around the Peruvian coast of ocean productivity of 800, which is more or less the same as around the Galapagos. However, these very, very thin, very rare locations with very, very high ocean productivity exist around Peru, do not exist around the Galapagos. They don't change the distribution of the available, but they allow the birds to change the distribution of used. So we see that around the Galapagos, available and used are distributed the same, which means they don't care about that resource that we are plotting, whereas around Peru, there's a very significant difference between the used and the, and the available, which means they targeted those very rare places with ocean productivity higher than 2,000, and they specifically flew to those places. And this is why they go. They go there because they want to feed in places where ocean productivity is higher than 2,000. So the 800 they can find around the Galapagos is just not high enough for them. They probably need like big fish hordes with high density that comes to those very... So ocean productivity is how much algae are there. But probably big schools of fish come to eat those algae and then they have dense schools and they can kind of, the albatross can poach them down. And for the last two minutes, the last thing you can, well, another example of a different kind of thing you can do with annotated data is run individual based models. Individual based models are a good tool for a step selection function. So this is not resource selection, this is step selection. How does it choose how fast or which direction to do the next step? We use this for the study of zebras. You see the Okavango Delta is this dark river delta there. It's a river that spills into the desert and seeps into the sand and disappears. And it's a wetland, it's green year round. And though this white thing on the other corner is the Mahadi Hadi pen, is a salt pen where just in the wet season, very rarely for just a week or two every year, water floods it and then evaporates. So it's a salt pen, it's totally moon-like environment. There's no plants, there's nothing there. But just around the salt pen, just after the flood where it's still not very salty, there's a lot of vegetation that recently grew. Zebras love that. The, the bushes in the wetland, not so tasty. Fresh grass around the salt pan, fantastic. A few years ago, the government removed a whole bunch of veterinary fences that were separating the Okavango Delta from the Mahari Hari pen, trying to connect the entire northern Botswana to like one bioreserve, the three big nature parks, and they moved the fence between them to allow animal migration. And the next year after the fence moved, Zebras started migrating what was historically their migration about seven generations ago. So somewhere in zebra culture around the fire at night, grandmother zebras were telling the granddaughter zebras that somewhere there, now Botswana has no features, it's just flat, 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 flat. Somewhere, if you follow that direction at just the right time, you'll encounter this legendary fresh grown grass by the salt marsh. And the little zebras remembered and told their granddaughters, and then when the fence moved, okay, let's go there. And the question is, how do they, so there's a question of navigation, how do they know they need to go there? This we don't know. But we ran a step selection function, basically to understand how they time their movement. So it's very tricky. There's only about two, three weeks a year where there's water there. There's no water in between. They can only survive a few days without water, so they, and if it's too dry, they can survive less. So if they eat fresh grass, they don't need to drink a lot. So they need to leave at just the right time, and if they got there and there's no water there, they'll probably die. So it's, it's not an easy thing. You need to time it just right. And we know this is related to vegetation 
to N NDVI. NDVI is this vegetation index, and the rate of change of NDVI is the growth of vegetation. And if you notice, they are kind of at the edge. They're not on the super green, but they're not on the brown. They like to walk just at this edge between the brown and the green. So this is a space-time. This is like a time cube flipped and then pressed into 2D. So this is how far, if we, if we reduce the migration, the complex migra movement pattern into a 1D axis, how far they are along the way. So they start here, they want to get there. How far are they? there. So one good thing you need to learn to do with the very complex movement pattern is data reduction, too many dimensions. Try to reduce it to like a single, a single one-dimensional which elevation they were, which latitude they were, how far they were to destination, how much time since, whatever. There's different ways of reducing the data. So this is how far they are along that towards their destination, how far are they from home. And they kind of stay just at the edge of that, between the transition between the very brown and the very green. This is called surfing the green wave. It's a theory that was kind of pushed. Surfing the green wave means that they choose a certain degree of, the they, they optimize the derivative. So they choose a, a place not based on the value of greenness, but based on the derivative of greenness. They choose the place where the place and time where the greenness, the rate of change of greenness is, is maximal. It looked like that. We proved that they don't actually do that. It just looks like that. I had a big argument with reviewers about it. It almost didn't get published because of that. It upset a lot of people. They really wanted the green wave. But one thing to point out is that every now and then, and 2007 was a very dry year, Compared to the greenness pattern of 2008, you see much more green, much earlier. Zebra started going, made it halfway, decided, no, this is crazy, and then went back, right? Up is back, down is made it. So they, they were walking, 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 about halfway through. They, they reached almost there. They were 50 kilometers from their destination, which is kind of half of the time into the trek, but they were almost there. And they were like, no, this is crap, horrible place. I don't want it. Went all the way back. Stayed another few days back and like, okay, yeah, I was too, I changed my mind too quickly and then went there again. And few of them, that year many of them did that and few of them died on the way back because there was no water anymore. So this question of timing was, was critical to understand what they do. So now we annotated the data with vegetation greenness and with precipitation. And we can then do a derived variable of the spatial and temporal derivative of greenness, or so the rate of change of greenness. And we can also do the cumulative precipitation. So we choose an arbitrary start point, in this case two weeks before the first zebra started migrating, and look how much precipitation accumulated since then. Because the precipitation is very discontinued pattern. There's a lot of rain, then it stops for a few days. So if you look at the precipitation, rate at a certain observed time, it usually makes no sense. And then we use those to calculate different models. And this is the winning, this is the winning model. We use an AIC approach, information criteria. The more variables you throw at the problem, the more accurate your model looks. But if you throw a random variable, you can still make it more accurate. So at some point, it doesn't make sense to keep throwing variables at the problem. You kind of You've exhausted all the correlated information, now you're getting into splitting random noise. So we did that study through another variable, another, another, another look where we need to stop, and here's where we decided to stop. So we know that the movement speed, not the, not the location, the movement, the, the rate of change of location, which is the speed, is a function of, there's some const, there's kind of some constant, more or less the average that they go, and then if there is strong rain, they'll go slower. If there's no rain, they'll try to go faster. And if greenness is coming in, they'll go faster. If it's not green, they'll go slower. And by combining just these two variables, the vegetation greenness and the precipitation rate, which we didn't expect will be important. We thought the cumulative will be more important. And again, notice this is not the rate of change of NDVI. This is NDVI itself, so this is not surfing the green wave, even though it looked like it. We can get a model that is very, very accurate, and except M3 in 2007, which 
that one decide, got there, decided to get back and then change its mind. So we can't explain crazy, but <laughs> everything else, we did a very, very reasonable work with an R square of 0 0.92, which is again, everything above three from nature is, there must be something there. So annotated data can help you do your research selection model. So we basically, right, we annotated that track for each point, we look at the condition, choose the next step, look at the conditions again, choose the next step. We created a virtual track and look at the the R square, which is the distance between the virtual, the square of the distance between the observed track and this simulated track and got a very accurate model. And I can stop here. Lots of people are doing end data. I don't have any animal movement data, so all those studies that I showed you, even though my name is a, there is a quarter, I didn't touch an animal. I never saw a tag. I just processed data. With that, you want a break? Questions? What? Well, um, you, uh, I want to show the front end. Move back front end. You want? Or I can just have another question. I want. Oh, we have a whole hour. Because we've got, yeah, we're just sitting around. Yeah. Let's go to movement. Yeah. Let's, let's do, um, well, let's see. Why don't we take coffee break and then uh, now, and then we'll.